but I'm so proud of my wife because she she recognizes my whistle. <laughs> she'll know she'll know exactly what it's like. This is like, oh, a mating that, call. <laughs> <laughs> this oh, we're birds, y'all. Let's be real. Hey, How Latin impo- America is full of like all these different birds. And <laughs> birds are always singing to each other. Latins are always singing to yeah, each other. There you it's go. just our people. <laughs> it's our cultura. Hola amigos, bienvenidos a otro episodio de Tech 23. Como saben, aquí hablamos de tech y cultura. We're here at Flor de Cuba, which gave away which flag we're representing today, a probar poquita ropa vieja, pero también hablar de tecnología. Estamos entrevistando a Cuban American, Felipe López, the CVO of Sun Blockchain. And we're very excited to go eat some good food, talk about tech, learn about how do we get more Latinos into tech and sustainability. But I'm not going to ruin it. I'm going to let Felipe talk for us and let's go meet him. I've um, never had garlic bread in the morning. Dude, I already ate like four of these. <laughs> <laughs> okay, garlic bread in the morning is good. Oh, yeah. You dunk it in a coffee? Yeah. Oh, no. okay. You've Here. never put butter okay. in your, in your oh, I've heard people coffee? Do that. No. It's amazing. <laughs> Bueno amigos, aquí estamos con Felipe, nuestro amigo de Cuba. Muchas gracias Felipe por estar con nosotros. Um, we actually had to do a little wake up and already started with the coffee, so a little cheers to with some Salud. cafecito. What cafecito are you having? We're having a cortadito, which is uh, traditional to Cuba. Yes. Yeah. So again, we're here at Flor de Cuba. What do you hear? What do you smell? Uh, and what are you excited to taste? I'm looking forward to the medianoche, mm. uh, the ropa vieja. Uh, croquetas, ooh, Y'all platanito, oh, yes. maduro. Yes, we gotta do that then. You have to do that. And there's a whole thing y'all can't see over there with pastelitos full of all the different things. I so walked right past <laughs> because I saved a little spot for flan. So I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you order first. Let's do a family style and uh, order. What, what, what we want? Hola, cómo está? Ahora sí. Él va. Él va a ordenar para nosotros. Okay, well... All the pressure. I know, right? (laughs) All right, Felipe, so this episode is about Latinos in tech. Mm -hmm. So we got to let the people know what makes you a Latino in tech. You have such a cool, interesting journey. Very abstract from uh, other guests we've we've done. And I'll be here enjoying my cafecito. Sure. Um, I guess my first real handheld enjoyment of tech Hmm. was a Game Boy... Color. Yes. I had all the Pokemon. (laughs) And I just wanted to be the very best. (laughs) Well, I gotta ask now, what's your favorite Pokemon? Oh. You might need to take it. Honestly, (laughs) I like. Eevee. Did you do the cards as well or just the oh, game? Oh, yes. Do you still I have had any of them? three holographic <laughs> first edition Charizards. <laughs> okay. That, like, I have Pokemon cards. Yeah, it's cards. like, in case the economy ever goes down. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have <laughs> currency. Have <laughs> it's not gold, but somebody <laughs> wants it. <laughs> That's awesome. I got more into Digimon than I did Pokemon. <laughs> no, I got into Digimon also. I also got into Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh right. was cool. I watched the TV show. So you're getting into video games, first time touching tech. Uh, any computers in the household? I know we yeah. didn't really get one until way later. Well, my parents had computers for work. And okay. And that was kind of my first introduction into computers. But um, honestly, I wasn't really into it until social chat platforms like mm. AIM or Zenga or, of course, leading into MySpace. What was your AIM name? I called it AIM. <laughs> it was AIM, AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, I don't even remember. I know my mother found out and she deleted every profile I had. <laughs> every time, like, no love. I'm over here trying to communicate with random strangers on the internet. And <laughs> she That's just delayed. noped it. Now, as a parent, I'm doing the exact same thing to my kids. And then I'm just realizing as an adult, That's all I'm doing every day anyways, is talking to strangers on the internet. (laughs) As a kid, Pokemon and the Game Boy was was such a go-to because I didn't have... I, I, well, I did have a console. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a PlayStation 1. Okay. That was a game changer, Mm -hmm. but... Because I played, as as a Cuban little boy, I played baseball religiously. Mm. Um, I was always playing baseball. I loved the sport. Um, It really pushed 
my mental capacity mm-hmm. into all these different factors that could be happening at any given moment. Mm. Um, and baseball, because it's a math sport and a statistics-based sport, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think it really had me lean into math. And that's what honestly pushed me in further into tech as I got older. And then, yeah, when we were home, PlayStation 1 for sure. Favorite so. games on it? Spyro. Spyro. <laughs> Spyro. Our, our producer's freaking out because that was our I, favorite I, I see that. Did you stick with PlayStation after that? I did. Okay. I did, and I considered my younger brother a <laughs> traitor when he brought the <laughs> Xbox home. My system the console is uh, at a garage sale. I got my first NES, uh, oh, wow. and I had Duck Hunt and Mario Bros, and nice. I played that thing all the time. Wow. I still don't understand, but somebody enlightened me, how the little Duck Hunt game worked, mm-hmm. because we had an old TV, but somehow it was super accurate of where you shot, and you don't, you can't do that with new video games now with the higher TVs. Right. My cousin, we, we'd go visit him a lot, had a N64. Mm-hmm. And I got super into uh, GoldenEye, James Vaughn game, Very the shooting. Nice. Oh, loved it, yeah. Very and nice. And then uh, I think I had a GameCube after that. We played NBA Jam, and that was cool. Or Street, no, Street Ball or something like that. That was a cool system. Mm-hmm. Like, I really liked the Cube. I wish it did a lot better. Mm. Like, I wish they continued that, but something about the tiny discs. Yeah. You know, because at the time, right. the they computers, were like, the size like of- you could go to McDonald's and get a tiny video game <laughs> disc as a toy. Anyways, those just faded out just mm-hmm. like cartridges and then all these other additional devices that i think it's amazing that you had some of those older ones like i hope mm-hmm. you still have those <sighs> somewhere okay, so. in a garage maybe i gotta look <laughs> uh, but they were nowhere like kept in a good condition this one's for my mom <laughs> who's the reason i had to buy all my pokemon <laughs> games back <laughs> what happened there garage sale <laughs> Yo, I think it got donated. Oh, no. Like, like I was like, <laughs> those are first gens. Oh, so somebody out there. Somebody out. out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want those back. Somebody's going to be like, where did she donate them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go no, look no, 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 for Maybe sure. they're out in the back of the for box. Sure. It, it, was, it, it was just funny. Okay, uh, baseball. Yes. So you you actually get, you, I know. I mean, I never saw you play, but from what you told me, you were really, 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 really good. I was pretty good. I was pretty good. Um, Yeah, it it was just one of those things where I felt like I had a really good grasp on the sport. So I wanted to end up pushing myself further um, on more of the conscious and the conceptual plane. And art kind of provided that open door access Mm -hmm. to doing that. Baseball was great, though, because it taught me a lot uh, in regards to teamwork. It taught me physical ability and mm-hmm. strength and how to, you know, maintain, you know, your your physical health, which is very important mentally, emotionally, and, of course, spiritually. So, yeah, baseball was definitely something I was into. And then I came home for a couple of weeks, met my now wife, <laughs> and at that point I was already represented by... Uh, a, an art gallery here mm. in Houston and uh, I did not want to travel for nine months of the year mm-hmm. I wanted to continuously enjoy my wife mm-hmm. um, oh, there's a surprise coming oh yes yeah, yeah. this is amazing yeah, wow look at this medianoche perfect mm-hmm. nice No, but it's amazing. Amazing. Look at that media on Wow. <laughs> I'm a rookie in Cuban food, so you, I, I'll <laughs> you're going to have to eat half of that. <laughs> yes, for sure. And then probably order a to-go one. Yes. <laughs> so, ropa vieja, media luna. Media noche. Media luna. Media noche. <laughs> there's, there's only one way of sharing this. Yeah. You just got to eat half. Oh, this is good. You know, somebody gave us a, a panini press kind of thing oh, for our, for our thing. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I used it to grill meat. <laughs> but the pi- the main picture on it is for a cubano, like a sandwich. Uh-huh. And I, I haven't I haven't got that because also I haven't I don't I haven't found this bread anywhere. All right, she did tell me they had some picante. Yes, I do like to eat spicy. My first bite of a media noche. Mm. Wow. Mm. I gotta try that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's try this. 
label us. We have oh. no idea. <laughs> Look at this. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. That's what he into. knows. It's good. <laughs> this is the secret sauce. Mm hmm. Mm. Try it. Dip it Yo, into that. That is amazing. freaking delicious. It's Tiene got banero? it. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Tal vez tiene piña. Tiene piña? It's like a... Oh, damn. It's so good. <laughs> well, I have to make sure I get at least one bim boom in. Okay. Yeah. Bim boom. <clears throat> What's that? It's just something Cubans do. Oh, okay. It's a, <laughs> like, I don't know why. It's a bim boom. <laughs> You're gonna go to Miami, <laughs> and if you have a Cuban pilot, You'll get a ping pong. Oh, no <laughs> All right, Felipe, so I just dug into my first ropa vieja, but before I eat it, what's the, I mean, I saw me arrimar un poquito rosito, some, some yuca. You like what Rice you and beans, like, just all mixed. you oh, just so kind of mix. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Because okay. it's just all mixed. You just honestly have mm -hmm. to just. Ah, there we go. Get all the, in there. Look at that. It's a work of art. <laughs> this is sculpture right here. And then you give that a minute, Let that rice is going to soak juices. it all up. Normally, if that rice was on a separate plate with the um, mm -hmm. frijoles negros, you would just take the entire thing of rice, a spoonful and a spoonful. Mm -hmm. uh. You know, because we have microphones in front of us right now, it makes it really hard to eat like an authentic, like you, like you really <laughs> like an authentic Cuban. <laughs> because there's a scene on Fantastic Mr. Fox. Okay. This movie that we watch with our children. And they're just, they're a bunch of animals. And then when they're ready to eat and they have all this food on all these plates, they're like, <laughs> they're eating like that. My father would also eat like this. He would eat very mm. close to the plate. My mother would tell him, Pete. You don't have to worry. Castro's not going to take your food here. <laughs> but he still eats like yeah. that. He's afraid. I understand. That's deep-seated trauma. Mm. We're going to tackle that, Pop. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to get to the root of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One frijoles negro at a time. One pimpun at a time. <laughs> One pimpun at a time, yes. <laughs> One pimpun. For the, for the Mexicans, I think we have this little whistle that, like, now that we, we've... I've, I need to hear what this. What is that? Uh, Pablo's experiment. Like, I've done it <laughs> multiple times. Uh, we're at the store, and mm -hmm. I just go... Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> and she's, yes. Uh, she's like, I'm over here. And it's like, I, all my tios and my, my dad, they have, like, you, you eventually recognize the tone of their yes. whistle and everything. Yes. Because, like, we'll go to, uh, you know, the mall or the store or whatever, mm -hmm. and there's multiple people sometimes giving a little whistle. But I'm so proud of my wife because she, she recognizes my whistle. <laughs> <laughs> she'll, know, she'll know exactly what it's like. This is that, a oh, mating that, call. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this, we're birds, y'all. Let's be real. Hey, How Latin America is full of, like, all these different birds. <laughs> and <they're laughs> birds are always singing to each other. Latins are always singing to yeah, each other. It's go. just our people. <laughs> it's our cultura. We fueled you up for some, some good conversation. Yes. What kind of art um, are we talking about and how did that lead into tech? It was more of like art and music. Mm. A photograph of an eight foot sculpture in a field mm. is very different in the room than the eight foot sculpture yeah. in good the point. space. And music was the same way. And art and music really went hand in hand because so much tech is involved mm -hmm. in both um, or could be involved mm -hmm. in both. So as an artist, I began with painting, oil painting, watercolor, mm -hmm. acrylic. Uh, I love pastels. Um, that was something my father always did. My father has a, a great artistic hand, mm -hmm. which is where I get it from. Um, so, yeah. Ooh. Wow. Uh-huh. Es el más reconocido de Cuba. Mami. Oh, el de mamey, perfecto. Y el de mango, sí. Gracias. Mm. Wow. Oh. My father would have taken a break for that <laughs> first sip as well. So I had a mentor after I left high school at about 16, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she was an art mentor, Diana Muniz, at a local nonprofit here in Houston called Mecca. She was the first teacher that really started taking me under her wing and we went to museums. She mm. taught me all the drawings. She really pushed me on the conceptual side. And that was the part where she knew that I might have something uh, to offer. 
So tell us about SUN. It stands for Sustainability United for Nurturing Nature. Mm. It uh, came from my wife, mm. Megan uh, Henley. So thank you so much, dear. Uh, Megan Henley Lopez. Humans are holistically natural mm. and they need to be. And I think this relationship between humanity and nature is something that needs to be reinvigorated. Mm. And this is what came about for Sun because humans are energetic beings and we require a certain amount of energy to maintain and sustain with our daily mm. lives. And in this, we wanted to create something called energy equity, the human right of what you would need in order to energetically sustain yourself. So this goes into providing natural resources, food, energy, internet, um, those types of connections, mm -hmm. and a resiliency that this world has always naturally provided that we're just not harnessing mm -hmm. within our technological advancements mm -hmm. in a Socratic, strategic mm -hmm. way that would provide ease for all of our lives mm -hmm. simultaneously. An example of this would be all the resources harnessed hyper-locally to where supply chains are broken down. We saw supply chain issues happening during the pandemic. We saw mm -hmm. food shortages happening during the pandemic. These provided services mm -hmm. uh, became limited, nil, or mm -hmm. non-existent. And I, I, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then before we get more into the mm -hmm. like why Sun exists, what is the technology involved in building out Sun? Sure. So there's a few different technologies involved. There's mm -hmm. software and okay. then there's hardware. Mm -hmm. The software side, we're utilizing our, a blockchain. These are public ledgers on the blockchain for a value system with multiple utilities that would quantify mm -hmm. and track data. Uh -huh in an open sourced manner. So this shows trust mm -hmm. and transparency. And these are important factors. Blockchain provides that trust and transparency that anybody anywhere can see and, uh, and yeah. utilize. So what about the hardware? The hardware side is a variety of different systems that produce energy in different okay. ways. Okay. Some of them could be anaerobic digestion, which is utilizing your waste in order to produce methane gas mm -hmm. to heat or mm -hmm. power. Solar is another one. My favorite is geothermal because I've been for the last year and a half in Houston telling oil and gas companies, don't cap Retap, And the mm -hmm. reason is because if you've already made the investment to drill, mm -hmm. when that well is done, you can easily make a further investment to have geothermal energy, mm -hmm. which is continuously providing that same type of heat mm -hmm. in order to cause natural power mm -hmm. and sustainably. There's a lot of different technologies out there. A couple of them utilize water through the atmospheric generation. If you have a lot of humidity, uh -huh. you can pull fresh water right mm -hmm. out of the air. And this changes the way that we interact with fresh water. Mm -hmm. Because right now in underdeveloped countries, you typically have to have a well system yeah. or a natural mm -hmm. stream of living water. I did see one of the pitches that y'all had done. Mm -hmm. I saw these uh, kind of like shipping containers mm -hmm. that were being transformed. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know more about those. Well, they're turnkey self-sustaining growing systems. Mm -hmm that utilize 95% less water than traditional agriculture. Because we're in Texas and mm -hmm. we've gone through the worst drought, we need to utilize these new hardware technologies mm -hmm. to provide resiliency. Why a grow system agriculturally? Because it cuts down shipping mm -hmm. and provides nutritional density that right now is just being removed completely from mm. our food systems. This is a huge, huge push for agriculture, mm. and it's an opportunity for people to own their resources mm. and their and, and resilience. Mm -hmm. It's also a way that people can have workforce solutions. These are new jobs mm. that are being created. 
and the food is fresh. You have different systems with this. You could do it hydroponically, you could do it aeroponically, or you could do it aquaponically. Mm. Aquaponic is so interesting. Yeah, I was gonna say, explain each one of the right, right. big words. Aeroponic utilizes nutrients just like hydroponics does, where you have to have them as additives. Aquaponically utilizes a full ecosystem. You have fish, you feed the fish, mm. the fish's poop is the nutrients that the plants need, and it runs through a full system. So this way you have more of a zero waste system, mm -hmm. and the water, of course, can be easily collected with rainwater. The lights can be powered with solar, mm -hmm. and it becomes a closed loop system without any expense or mm -hmm. any additional strain on the current grid infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Why is Sun so focused on providing energy equity is because we're so focused on building additional infrastructure mm -hmm. that we can then quantify that data and show real world examples mm -hmm. of what's being done. So this way, you can even have a governed say mm -hmm. utilizing blockchain technologies in a DAO or decentralized autonomous organization mm -hmm. type of a structure to where you can make a say as to what your community needs or what your mm -hmm. community might want. And this is a powerful voting mechanism. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more on Sun and like the future that you guys see. Let's imagine you're talking to, to the general sure. Latino population. Sure. Where do they start in like educating themselves a little bit more about the sure. process and, uh, and what is the future that you're kind of like envisioning for, for the Latino community? Sure. How does the future of Sun mm -hmm. look? We look at providing fully self-sustaining communities mm. because it doesn't make sense for us to live in the kind of community. And we're in Houston, so, yeah. you know, you live in a neighborhood that you sleep in, but then you got to go drive somewhere else to go yeah. do something. We're talking about instead of having male trees up and down, um, having fruiting yeah. trees, creating wastewater systems, yeah. it's completely reworking our entire utilities. Mm -hmm. These systems, they're so engineered that they focus nothing on biology. For Latinos, if you're going to be looking at making these types of changes in your community, mm -hmm. You need to start by educating yourself about how these different systems work and then coming up with innovative and creative ideas to solve your community's energetic needs. Mientras estábamos platicando, nos trajeron estos dominoes. Did that say professional? Double, oh, double nine, nine professional, professional dominoes. This is in a wooden box <laughs> and everything. Really it's not her. cigars because, you know, <laughs> we don't smoke inside in America, <laughs> except for Miami, which is not America. <laughs> it's just like Cuba 2.0. You see a movie about Miami yeah. and there's always dominoes. I was born in Texas and raised here. What is a, a fiction with dominoes with Cubans? I don't know. I just think they all like counting things. Uh, like, I okay. have no idea. You know, in the Mexican household, you saw Loteria at every single event. We played at everything. Is there dominoes being played at every Cuban event? If there's people still awake mm -hmm. after consuming that amount of food, yeah. there's a whole area in Little Havana in Miami mm -hmm. that Sunday mornings after mass, <laughs> all the little viejitos were out there <laughs> slamming dominoes down on the tables, someone screaming, Pete la porra, cigars all over the place, and cafecitos and batidos también. Ping pong everywhere. Yeah, ping pong everywhere. <laughs> Pim pum, like ah, you know, <laughs> pim pum. <laughs> we have like eight more pim pums to get in, so yeah, you watch yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the story about baseball and art, and it made me think about if somebody is artistically inclined, and regardless of what medium, mm -hmm. if they are also tech inclined, what advice do you have for somebody to really make the most out of it, to really like do something with it that can make the world a better place, kind of what you did? Learn about NFTs, mm. non-fungible tokens. Mm -hmm. These are important, right? Our people are culturally rich, artistically rich, mm. musically brilliant. This is intellectual property. Mm. This is your family's legacy. Those royalties are owed to the artists and the creatives of secondary market transactions. And that is so important because most creatives focus on the primary market sale, 
which is the first sale. Mm -hmm. But the real wealth is built in the secondary markets, mm. especially in the visual art market. Mm. Now, for musicians, these are royalties for every single time your music is played. played. And this yeah. is really, really important because mm -hmm. so many Hispanics and Latinos and Latinas are always sending money back yeah. home or trying to help out their families See. in some way. Yeah. And this type of technological structure provides more of a long-term plan mm -hmm. for creatives mm -hmm. where most creatives don't typically have 401ks, yeah. life insurance, mm -hmm. honest financial planning. Yeah. Um, and financial literacy is so important. Mm -hmm. If you're going to learn anything, learn financial literacy and have a basis in legal language mm -hmm. because the legal language is very different from the regular yeah. way you and I speak. And this also shows how you can structure your mm -hmm. businesses to further enhance your community. This is equity for your cultures. You want to stop the milking mm -hmm. of your people for profit mm -hmm. without any reward going back to the people. I so, love what you said, that it's your uh, intellectual property, it's your legacy. More important than ever is, is to understand that because as the United States and the rest of the global economy right. wakes up to the powerhouse that is the Latino market in the United States, yep. our voice, our art, yep. our music, our films, or anything, our, uh, they're, they're climbing up in value because this is, I mean, even this podcast, right? We're trying oh, yeah. to be authentic and, you know, we, we get to do this and <laughs> it, it doesn't feel fake because it's legit. I think that is very important for everybody in general to understand that reaching Hispanic Heritage Month, every Latino is getting pulled left and right to like, can you come speak here and can you do this and you can do that? Well, th those stories, like you said, they're worth gold. They're yes. worth like a, a lot. I think better financial understanding e even gives ourselves like, no, all this stuff is like really, really uh, worth it because we know a couple of decades behind those stories were suppressed because of just right. trying to protect yourself. And that's why I know we have some of our Latino brothers and sisters that they don't speak they don't Spanish because they weren't taught Spanish at home as a uh, like maybe form uh, of, t of Americanization. Yeah, that's something that I dealt with mm -hmm. for sure. And now I just rely on how many trips can I make to Miami in a year to pick up the Spanish I didn't get before. <laughs> so can you leave us with some very practical advice? I want to know which terms should this group of Latinos uh, start Googling, searching, and, and like just learning more about You need to start researching intellectual property, mm. equity. This is how much of something do you own and how to manage, maintain, and sustain your community's natural resources. What are some other terms uh, that like maybe some industries we should be looking into? Sure. 73% of immigrants here in America are the reason why the agricultural community has its backbone. So agricultural technologies is so, so, so important mm -hmm. because this is going to be the resiliency of all people mm -hmm. as the climate crises seem to continue. We need to find these types of solutions in order to provide sustainable resiliency. Mm -hmm. And we need to be the ones bringing those to not just our communities, but to every community. To the world. Now, we will get kicked out of the restaurant if we pray traditional style, but how do you finish a, a game uh, usually? Oh, with, just don't, oh just, man. Just don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> with the strong ping pong, ping pong. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, ping pong is, you know, <laughs> ping pong. <in> a <laughs> I do have one uh, thing I really want to talk about. So, you know, on your title on LinkedIn, Chief Visionary Officer. Super cool, dope title. Um, but who is your CEO? My CEO is my better three quarters. <laughs> it's my wife. Uh, she's mother of uh, our four children. And she's a total badass. Awesome. Maybe some lessons learned about your journey in co-founding Sun together as a married sure. couple. Um, I was personally intrigued because this company, Tech 23, Tech 23, mm -hmm. is also co-founded by a married couple. So I was just personally interested in like, you know, I mean, we've had our struggles. Don't lie to me and say y'all oh. haven't had any because I know you'd be. I'm not <laughs> I know you have. I'm not gonna pay attention to anything else you're gonna say then. Uh, I love working with my co-founder. Mm -hmm 
because we know how to push and pull each other into that next level up. Hmm. And that's key. It also allows us to go through what we've been doing, honestly, since th- this is really the core foundation of our relationship has been through intellectual uh, communication. Mm. We go into deep conversation, into deep thought, Socratic methods of debate and thinking. This is very, very important because we bond with the mind before bonding with the body and the mm-hmm. spirit. Megan is a great communicator. Mm-hmm. She's done PR and marketing for 20 years. Uh, she's the one that's normally on stage. She's the one that's pitching nationally. Um, she, she's just amazing. All the pitch decks, all the social media you're going to see is all from her. And I'm the chief visionary officer because I'm the head seed sower. Mm-hmm. I'm the guy that is in the background mm-hmm. that says very little and plants the seed and uh, this is how we work so i think at a large scale i think at how everything is going to be structured Mm -hmm. um and i don't want to say i i say i a lot but it's really my team Mm -hmm. but it's important because a lot of us are on the same wavelength of thoughts Mm -hmm. um and we see these problems arising on a global level and we're trying to become 10 steps ahead. Mm-hmm. And we have to with this level of innovation because of how quick it moves, mm-hmm. which is why if you are Latino interested in these types of technologies, don't wait for a school to teach you because it's not gonna go fast enough. School is not fast enough for our people. We have to do it ourselves. We have to go to the library, not the mall, spend time on books, not on clothes. Uh, concerts are cool, but you know, you do is free Um, (laughs) stream Megan has so eloquently showcased what we're trying to do at a high level while explaining it Mm -hmm. so simplistically that my children or our children understand it as this is mommy and daddy save the world project and when our kids ask us why we're doing and this is a struggle to be a startup Mm -hmm. this is not easy if you're going to do this find yourself a significant other that you can build with Mm -hmm. because you're trying to do a couple of things in the long term you're trying to build with somebody for the long term and not just a business way but in a a familiar in in a communal way what is this it doesn't connect. <laughs> this is where our fake rules are coming out. Oh, wow. It's very rich. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, dulce de leche, which I, I, it looks like an exotic uh, Rice crispy treat. Flan. Mm. <laughs> okay, I have to All try right. this. Oh. Oh, those are sorts of on point. Oh, it's cold. Mm. Mm. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite you have, for to, a you have to take one home. What are the conversations we should be having next time you find yourself, like, with your family, with your friends, sharing un postrecito, you know, domino? We should honestly be focusing on having thought-provoking conversations. Mm. This is a perfect setting because nobody's defenses are up. Mm-hmm. You're playing a harmless game. You're having fun. You're harmless being, for now. Harmless for now, yeah. (laughs) But once we get to that last domino... (laughs) We need to be talking about who are the future thought leaders and creating the future thought leaders and philosophers and great thinkers of Latin America. Who are the current ones now that we're just not hearing anything about? A lot more than just what's going on in the telenovelas. You know, the other things that are utilized to maintain and capture and all of our mental space. We need to create future thought leaders, not just entertainers. Felipe, una vez más, thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, fortunately, we don't have a, a Cuba flag out here, but we'll put it, yeah, th- this is our, this is the our Cuba our flag. Uh, Vete, thank you so much. We ate delicious food. Thank you, Flor de Cuba, for una experiencia increíble. Make sure you subscribe. That allows us to share more of this content, to find more Latinos in tech like Felipe. This has been a wonderful experience. Gracias, Cuba, and I'm excited to one day visit. Adios. Adios.